It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. It's the Take Command podcast. What's up? What's happening? Our last pre-combine edition. That's Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And it is time, Logan, to do the episode that everyone has been waiting for. The ultimate 2024 NFL draft quarterback guide. Uh, The Washington Commanders, of course, sit with that number two pick. Uh, There are three top guys seemingly in a group. Maybe there's one top guy and then a group of two, depending on how you divide it. We'll get into it. Uh, Another group of three guys that all could go in the first round. And then there's some interesting names down the list. How does Washington attack this position? We will discuss for the entirety of this podcast by giving you kind of a a pre-combine guide, if you will, to all of these guys. And Logan, we have to start with Caleb Williams because he is the guy and has been the guy for a number of years. People have been targeting him since he was in high school uh, here in the D.C. area and goes out to Oklahoma, goes to USC, wins the Heisman, bit of a down year, but uh, people use the word generational with him. I think there's obviously some debate over whether that is true, but why, why does this draft start with Caleb Williams as someone who is not a unanimous number one, but uh, uh, certainly by far and away the favored number one pick and and favorite quarterback of a talented group? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. I think it's like when you watch the film, I think the film kind of speaks for itself. I think even this last year, 2023, which I think people would say is like a down year for him. And obviously 2022 wins the Heisman, but he's just got – it and I and like I'll do my best to explain what that it is but like he just has this tremendous ability to make plays like he can make every throw he has every arm angle he can layer throws he can push the ball down the field like his ability to just like contort his body and like again he's got to draw a lot of comps to Mahomes because they have a very similar play style in terms of what they do off schedule he can just do everything like I, I think the the throw that continuously sticks out to me whenever I think of Caleb Williams is he's sprinting as hard as he can to his left, like full speed sprint. The ball is in his right hand. He opens his shoulder and delivers a ball that has like zero loss of velocity. And there are just very few people, maybe one other person on the face of the planet who can do that. So like physically from an arm talent standpoint, it's just such a unique thing to watch. You know, it's not Josh Allen who's just pushing the football down the field like a lunatic. It's a different type of skill there because he doesn't have the same horsepower as Josh Allen from an arm standpoint, but he's got this 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 Rolodex and this ability, this contortionist element to his game that's very, very special. I think he sees the field at a very high level and his ability to make plays back there. I know people are going to knock him for that, but I actually really like that. I like his ability to kind of scramble and buy time and kill you with his legs and make the offensive line better in certain situations. Obviously, I think they're, this year specifically, got to rein some of that in. I think there were times we were watching games where he, people throw the term out, he's playing hero ball, and you see that, right? But I like that that's part of him. And even when he's playing hero ball, I think he only turned the football over like six times in like those hero ball situations. You know what I'm saying? So he's still pretty fastidious with the football. And again, there's something about him. Like it just that that it factor, that 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 ball of clay, that projection just seems so natural for him. And you're like, man, if you get him with the right coach in the right situation, like that he's got the highest ceiling from a quarterback perspective, at least from what I've seen. And I think that's why he's been very, he's, he's kind of been the unanimous number, unanimous number one guy. And you couple that with the 2022 season where he is like knocking the ball out of the park. Like he's definitively the number one guy. And I, and so I don't know that that's what you're getting from him. And is he a perfect prospect? No, he's not. He's not Trevor Lawrence coming out or Andrew Luck where you're like, this guy's going to be an excellent pro from day one. There's issues to his game, but I just think that, that magic that he brings from an arm talent and an arm ability standpoint is just so unique. And plus, and that's not it by itself. Just also the way he sees the field is pretty dynamic also. So, yeah, I think with him is such an interesting evaluation because there's stuff that you can't coach and that no one could ever possibly coach. And that's the Mahomes stuff, you know, there, and there's other guys that have it. Nobody does it to patch level, obviously, but like Kyler Murray does some of that, you know, Allen does some of it. It looks different, like you said, but like, I think Kyler's the other guy that when I think of like throwing on the run and it just, it looks so different because Kyler's so damn compact. Uh, But like with Mahomes, it just like, 
there's a magic to it because it looks different because he's bigger. Caleb's actually pretty split. He's closer to Mahomes' size, um, but he's like six one, I think. Actually, that's yeah. that's one of the interesting things. We'll see what he measures into the combine. Yeah. Um, Pat's six three, um, but Mahomes, I think he's six three. I, sh- I shouldn't. Uh, well, by the way, just throw that out just there. Side sidebar. Uh, some of the research I did in the trivia game on the last. Uh, Rough. Yeah, I, I I had a couple of misses there. I should have. This is why we need someone. A fact to, checker. Yeah, fact checker to let me. So to all of you who left YouTube comments, uh, checking that stuff. Uh, thanks. Uh, but no, Mahomes is Mahomes is six two. Williams uh, coming out of USC is listed as six one. We'll see where he actually measures in. Uh, where Kyler's obviously you know he measured at five ten. He's five nine, five ten somewhere in there. Um, but that that same kind of off platform, uncoachable pulls a rabbit out of his hat, comes from like a competitive refuse to die kind of place that we see how much that matters. Like when you can hone that mentality and that ability, you get Patrick Mahomes final drive in the Super Bowl. Like you get a competitive, mm-hmm. like just will find a way that you can't possibly coach. And I think the question becomes all the other stuff where you look at the Mahomes that was with Cliff at Texas Tech and Cliff you know, has made a point to say, like, I kind of let Pat be Pat. And I think that's also like, hey, yeah, obviously it's worked out because he got someone who gave him more structure in the pros. And maybe if Cliff was his pro coach, not his college coach, he would have done the same thing. Um, but, you know, can you then get, and that's obviously relevant if all of a sudden Caleb's there at two because, well, Cliff is the guy who will be shaping him here. Um, like the ability to coach that up and say like, okay, all that stuff is great. That's break in case of emergency. Here's how we went on schedule. And I think that's where, you know, where you talk about him being able to see the field really well, like that's super relevant. How well do you see it? How well do you process it? What systems work well for you? Are you a guy who can read coverage very well? Are you a guy who reads space really well? Like, what is it that you see well? Can you do all of it? Like, those are the questions that I think are kind of the really high level questions that I'd actually be really curious to talk to an evaluator about of like how you you know, beyond just like watching the tape and knowing what system they're in, like how do you evaluate those abilities of an air raid style space read offense versus like a pre-snap decipher Mm -hmm. information style offense versus we're doing a lot of post-snap reads. Like those are different skill sets to an extent. And I'd I'd be curious to see how a guy like Williams, obviously a guy like Daniels and May, who we'll talk about all process those different types of things. And by the way, we also don't know which one Cliff is going to use because he said, don't call my offense an air raid anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing is, like, he's a, he's a good football player. And you, the thing you're alluding to there, which I think is, like, the secret sauce, and if you could figure this out, like, I think you'd make a lot of money, is this idea of, like, what like what are they good at? How do they see stuff? And that's why they have all these, like, S2 cognition scores, and everybody's trying to find the magic bullet for, like, how they see information, how they process information. And it's, it's hard to tell because, like, I do think that there are times where you see him work really well on rhythm and in timing and hit stuff. It's like, looks a little NFL-ish. And you're like, oh, there you go. And then so the times where you're like, man, this is like, he's holding the ball for like five seconds. So obviously that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but long time. No, not always. Sometimes yeah. that's an ex- it's, it's an underestimate. He's had some eight, nine second plays. Yeah. And he's just, and he makes a tremendous play. And you're like, you know, I don't know how to quantify that, but I know that I like it. I know that like, that's kind of the direction the position's going. And again, like he's not, he, he's not, Michael Jordan, you know, he's not the second coming here. He's not LeBron James. He's, there are issues to his game, which make you reluctant, but I just go back to the, I just look at the talent. And again, there, a big part of this is going to be like how he interviews. I think that's going to be a huge element kind of what you're talking about. Like, how do you, how do you like him? Do you feel like he's wired the right way? Is that competitiveness you see on the field? Does that come across in his off field work? So uh, this, this, I think coming out of this week, you're going to have a lot of interesting information about him about where he's at and um, and how teams view him because, you know, talking to teams last year at the combine, like, you know, you're talking about quarterbacks or whatever, and his name would inevitably come up as the best player in college football. And now I, I it's hard for me to see it getting too far away from that. You know, people are going to say, oh, he didn't have, you know, the Notre Dame game was bad or this game was bad. But I think when you look at this year, the whole of this year, it's still pretty darn good. He was still pretty productive. They still won games. Did he have some bad games? Yeah, but I think the standard was, he didn't have a bad, not one bad game in 2022. Then he held, he had three in 2024, like, or 2023. I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay with like that dip in production because you've seen how good he is. And there's that great Bill Walsh quote. It's like, if you've seen greatness, like it's our job to get him out of, get him out of it, get him to do it consistently. 
And I think that's the issue you're going to have with him is yeah. you've seen it. He can do it. How do we maximize it? I mean, the thing is too, until this year, he also won a tremendous amount. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, they only lost two games. Obviously he wasn't the full-time starter, um, at Oklahoma, but they, they won a lot of the games that he played quite a bit in at Oklahoma as a freshman, they had a really good year in 2022. Obviously his Heisman winning season, they lose only three games, which, you know, by old USC standards is like, you know, five years worth when Pete Carroll was there, but like that hadn't been the program for a long time. And you know, they start this year really well, but they lose one, two, three, four, five out of their last six games. And then you go back to high school, you know, we had Mike, Mike Loxley on uh, the Maryland coach when we were out in Vegas and he talked about watching him pull wins out of his, have his hat uh, when he was at Gonzaga. Like, this dude was a, is a winner uh, up until the last half of this season. So, you know, what happened there? You know, can they figure out what what went wrong and, and why he was no longer able to produce at that high level? Um, some of the fumble problems, some of the things that cropped up for him individually, like what happened to them as a team. I think those are all the kinds of things that you're you're looking at. But then again, like, again, Mahomes at Texas Tech, like they lost a bunch of games. They also lost mm -hmm. some 50 to 48 sometimes where Mahomes had 500 yards. So yeah. um, an NFL evaluator is a lot more looking in, uh, a lot more than looking at a quarterback win loss record uh, for who you want to take with the number one pick. All right. So that you got that's that's kind of the book on Williams. Um, tremendous talent real questions about what he can do on schedule and with instruction in an NFL offense. That's the, that's the, the one or two sentence version. What is the, the one or two sentence version? Actually, before we get to Jaden Daniels, who we both like and who we took in our mock draft 1.0, let's talk about Drake may because for the majority of the year, it was Caleb Williams, Drake may Caleb Williams, Drake may because like Williams, he had a much better 2022 than he did 2023. So what is there to like about Drake May? And then we can delve into the concerns about Drake May. Yeah, so for the other show that I do, the Command Center show, we do like a ticket to the draft and we did a, uh, a quarterback thing. And we were talking about quarterbacks and where they stand. And, you know, for the longest time, I was not super high on Drake May, but I'm a, I'm a big guy that says like, I, while I see something a certain way and it's important to kind of listen to the crowd a, a little bit, right? I, I don't think you need to be totally dialed in, but there's a reason why he's there. And so this last week, actually, I really took like a deep dive on him specifically and just try to get a feel for like what he is. And I think the thing about Drake May is like, is he can do, he can do everything you want him to do. Like when you look at it, go, like, go there's a, there's a cut up of him. Just say Drake May highlights 2023. It's all of his big time throws from last year. And every single throw on there is a wow throw. And it's not a wow throw like we're throwing a fade, we're throwing a deep post where it's like, I am stepping up in the pocket. I have great mechanics. I'm on balance. I'm on rhythm. And I'm delivering a strike right over the middle of the field on a 20-yard dig with a guy draped on the, on the receiver's back. And I've just put that ball exactly where it needs to be. Or I've extended the play. I've, I've bought a little time. And like in a big Ben type of way in terms of his body stature and size, like stiff arming a guy off and delivering a frozen rope to a guy in a tight window. And so it's so when you see that stuff, like from a passing standpoint, it's significantly better than what Jaden Daniels is or can do. Right. I just think he's got a better feel for that stuff. <clears throat> and then you couple that with the fact that he is a pretty good athlete. You know, he was a very good high school basketball player. He comes from a family of high school basketball players. Um, and that shows up. And I'm not saying he's going to be this tremendous athlete in the NFL, like where a guy he's, you know, involved in the quarterback run game at a high level. But, you know, maybe on second and short, you know, second and goal, you can get him involved on like a zone read. and He can do some stuff for you. So actually, like I'm kind of shifting back to Drake Bay may being the definitive number two quarterback for me. And I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. And it's because of the stuff you see in terms of the pre-snap reads, the footwork, the consistency with the arm mechanics and his ability to kind of find throws. Now, some things that still really bother me about him is despite all of that good stuff, you see five to 10 throws a game where you're like, what are you doing? Like, why did that miss so bad? Like, I don't understand right. it. And it's so hard to get out of that. It's so hard to kind of take a step back and be like, like, look at all this other good stuff you did. But like in the, um, I forget what game it was. Gosh, I just watched it last night. Anyway, a game he played there, he's his, Completion percentage is good. Everything's going well. And then in the second quarter, he misses two open, like deep down the field throws. He misses an out and he misses like a uh, kind of over the middle, like check down. And you're like, if you complete these passes, you probably win this football game. 
And then right. you go to the then you go to the uh, the two minute situation at the end of the game where it's an opportunity for them to win. First off, great job driving the length of the field. They don't get a touchdown. They have to kick a field goal, so they get the ball back, drive it down. He throws an interception, and it's not entirely his fault. Ball gets tipped, whatever. But those moments, like they're you know like that was kind of a criticism of Herbert coming out was that he didn't like elevate and execute in these big moments. And while everything is like technically very good. For Drake May and you and the high level stuff is very high. It's very transferable. It seems like a one to one to the NFL almost in certain situations. He does do stuff that you're like, why did that happen? Like you're so good in these other areas. Where does this lack of consistency come from? Yeah, and that's the thing is like you watch him sometimes. You you mentioned the footwork is like a good thing, and then he just like forgets how to play quarterback for a quarter. Yeah, it's weird. And, it's and weird. his footwork gets really sloppy. And that's the kind of thing that you're wondering, I think, as an evaluator, like as he matures. And again, like when we say things like maturity here, we're not talking about the character. I have no idea if he goes out and parties and is taking care of his body and doing that, the, the maturity stuff there. I mean, as a football player, right? As a yeah. football player, does he mature into more consistency and the, the bad footwork with the right coaching goes away and all of a sudden you're like, no, we can unlock that greatness within him and get a consistent Justin Herbert level or better player out of Drake May. Or is he always just going to forget how to play football for stretches? His, his feet are going to be super sloppy. He's not going to step into a throw, and he's going to kill us with a pick six every three weeks because he tries to throw it out with lazy footwork, and in the NFL, you get pick six that way. And I think that's where I, I really struggle with May and why I still sit on Daniels with the right, you know, reserving the right to change my mind, but like, yep. you know, where I sit on Daniels as a more consistent player, um, especially last year, um, than, than May has been. And I think that's that to me is the, the struggle is like when it's right, it's excellent. But how often is it right? And I just, I, uh, I, I, I just, I've, I bluntly, as you can you know clearly hear me not able to finish a sentence, like I really struggle with that. It, it is, it is hard. And that's the one thing. Cause again, like you, the high level stuff is very high. The way he throws the football, excellent. Got the arm talent, got the ability to get it done, and and when you watch the the, the pre snap quarterback stuff is there, the post snap quarter step back stuff is there. Understanding where he's hot, understanding where the ball needs to go, I think he does that pretty well. But then you watch a game like Miami, and Miami is all over him, you know, for a lot of that game. Then you watch a game like Virginia, and that's the game I watched last night, and you're like, this is awesome, great job, push the ball down the field, nice post to Devontae Walker, great, you know, nice dig to Devontae Walker, way to lay that layer this in there. A lot of drop passes too. Some of that's an accuracy thing, but and then you get that stretch, and you're like, man, like what is this? And like when you compare him to Caleb Williams, who just seems to kind of always rise to the moment, or Jane Daniels this year specifically, who always kind of rose to the moment. I felt like there were times where that didn't always happen. And you know, I've heard great things you mentioned about his like. I heard he's a very charismatic leader. He commands the room. He's got that kind of that gravitas that you want the quarterback to have. So there's a a lot to like and the film's good when the film's good it's excellent you know and i think it's and that's kind of one of the reasons why you kind of start shifting back to drake may a little bit after watching jay Daniels because like some all 22 film is starting to kind of make its way onto the internet you can watch that a little bit more consistently and some of the ball placement with jay Daniels, like man that wasn't as good as i thought from the tv copy or that wasn't the, in the position i thought or whatever it was or, or he should make this throw and you don't really say that when you watch Drake May's film. It's like that tight window dig, I'm throwing it. And I trust myself to throw it. Now, again, he's not always perfect. And he's kind of trying to rifle balls into tight windows that aren't going to be there at the NFL level. But when you say, what is what is a more transferable skill set today? It's Drake May. It's just the thing that gets you is the big moments and the consistency. Like, And it's not like big stretches. But like I just mentioned six plays where it's like he's not consistent and you need that level of consistency to win football games at the NFL level. Now, to, again, to kind of f finish my thought, he's 21 years old. He's going to continue to grow and mature. And maybe that's something you feel good about betting on. But again, there is a lot of uh, that. that it's, it's something I just can't get past is why, why all of a sudden do you not look like you can play court? I like the way you worded that. It looks like I just forgot how to play quarterback. And it's not all the time, but there are stretches where you're like, what is happening? And that that flummoxes me for whatever reason. Yeah, I, I think with him and Daniels, who we'll transition to talking about here, like it's such a coach thing too. Like I, Cliff, oh, yeah. Cliff and um, 
you know, Tavita and Blau and like all, everyone else who's going to be involved, obviously DQ with the quarterback. Like I need to know what we're running and like how, or how we're going to build it around both these guys. Because, you know, we talked about this at the end of the Caleb, uh, you know, discussion of like, how do you see the field? Are you a space guy? Are you a coverage guy? Are you capable of doing both? Like, to me, that's really what it comes down to is like, how comfortable are you doing this at NFL speeds at the NFL level? And the, the skill sets are close enough, even though they're different, like there's, you know, positives here, negatives here, they switch on depending on which guy you're talking about, but like between Daniels and May, they're, they're close enough that if I feel like I can get more out of Jaden Daniels with my offense, I'm going Jaden, but I could, I totally understand the argument the other way around where you're going, dude, Drake is 21. I know how he thinks I can build an offense around that. The ceiling here is outrageous. We're taking yeah. Drake may like, yeah. I totally get that. And by the way, like, you know, I know it's, it's not the air raid, but he comes out of an air raid system. He was recruited by Phil Longo, uh, who's now at Wisconsin, but the same guy that recruited Sam Howe. And, you know, they run that similar air raid system still in Carolina and that, you know, seeing the field that way and, and having experience in that could certainly vault him into that number two spot uh, in the eyes of the commanders as Cliff builds this offense up. Like, I, I think that it's certainly feasible. Um, and by the way, what a wacky that would be if all of a sudden your quarterback room is him and Sam Howell, yeah. which it was a couple of years ago, Sam's last year at, at UNC. Yeah, and I think I think the other thing is that that makes you feel a little bit better about Drake May is that he there's just more throws on tape, and what I mean by that is just a more a wider variety of throws. That you know we got the deep high cross over the middle of the field, the deep dig is nice in there, and not that Jane doesn't have it, but just there's a a complicated there's more, there's more of it. Not to say that North Carolina's offense is crazy complicated, it's not, but you just see him do more stuff, and I think that that is like with a higher football IQ and. Not saying Jaden doesn't have a high football IQ, but he didn't. He wasn't afforded the opportunity to do some of the stuff that we're talking about. So I, again, like I still really like Jaden Daniels, but I, I do think there is. I understand the Drake May perspective much better now after watching the All Twenty Two, digging on some of this stuff because it's like, man, like he is very close to just being like NFL ready. You know, it's just about finding the coaching staff, finding the opportunity to kind of make sure he's supported. Because I think that's another great point you brought up there. It's not just about um, his talent right now. It's about what he's going to be and the staff and how they can develop him. And if you think he's going to develop himself. Because, like, he couldn't play in the NFL today. It's closer than Daniels, but you need to make sure that you have a development plan and something that encourages his growth. And ultimately, for any of these players we're going to talk about, like, because there is, there's no Andrew Luck. There's no... Um, you know, there's no Lawrence, like these guys yeah. are projects in a different way than those guys are. Those guys come around maybe once a decade and, uh, it hadn't been a decade yet since Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. Um, and even Trevor, like I, he's a but, peg down from what luck was like, there's two dudes ever that get like the a plus 99 grade and it's Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck. And yeah. like, even then, I mean, obviously there are other great quarterbacks that in hindsight maybe should have, but like coming out, sure thing. These guys will not bust. Um, those are the two, and right. none of these guys are are that. Um, that leaves us of the top three with the guy that I think has been our favorite so far, and yeah. that is Jaden Daniels. There's still so much to like. I, I love the way he throws it. Obviously, the speed is is great. He's going to run a four four, maybe even four three, but probably a four in the four fours uh, next week in Indy. Um, again, great arm. He he knows how to make plays outside the numbers, um, which I think is going to be really important in this offense, whatever version it winds up being, um, you know, there, there's a ton to like, there is, I think a more consistency with some of the footwork and stuff, at least from what I was able to, to watch, mm -hmm. uh, maybe with a, a wider sample in the all 22. And you see that mm -hmm. that footwork is locked in on, on at missing some guys. Like, I don't, I don't know what extra perspective you have now, cause we're doing this on the show. We haven't talked about this beforehand yeah. since you've had this more information, but um, where are you at on, on Daniels after watching it where maybe it wasn't as high as a grade as a couple of weeks ago? So I think the thing about Daniels that, I, that I'll always love, regardless, is dude makes plays. Like, yeah. I watched the Alabama Even game. Even if he get looks like a cartoon character when he gets hit, he'll yeah, try. And I, th and I think that's the tough thing about the Drake May, Jane Daniels evaluation, at least off the all 22s I've been able to gather, right? So one's against Minnesota. The other one's against Virginia. And no offense to those schools, but, you know, Minnesota runs straight cover four. And it's cover four every single time. So if I'm Drake May and I'm pretty smart before the snap, I know where the ball needs to go. 
And when I'm not in a cover four look, another bring in pressure. So I'm going to take advantage of that, right? So I think it kind of simplified what they are, right? And so then when you watch when you watch Alabama on the All-22, it's like the wild freaking West out there, right? There's like they're in quarters, they're in cover six, they're rolling and stuff, they're matching backside. It is very NFL-y in terms of defensive philosophy. So when he does, when he does, when he does pull the ball down or when he is being fastidious with the football, I'm like, I kind of get it because I don't even really know what coverage this is. And I understand like now with the clicker in my hand, I know the ball should go here, but like that's tough to see real time with real bullets. I think the thing coming out of the Alabama game that was a little bit disconcerting, not disconcerting, just kind of put a, a, a put a red flag on him if you want, was some of the accuracy stuff on the quick game. So like, you, you know, you got a guy running a hitch or running a comeback and the ball is left inside and the guy makes a play and it's in a good spot. And he's thrown with anticipation and the rhythm, but it's like, get that ball placement correct. And that was something that I thought he was excellent at, but you kind of see a little bit of work with what he's doing, right? But I, I just want to lay that lay this in there too. Best deep ball thrower of anybody of these top three guys. He throws an awesome slot fade, awesome deep post, like hitting guys in stride, excellent. And he also, again, is pretty accurate. I talked about the ball placement stuff, but for a guy that's known as a runner, he throws the football. And I, he gets a lot of comps like RG3 as an example. And I went back and I watched old RG3 film, and it's not the same guy. Right. He sees the field way better than that. I think he's a more natural runner than that. I think he's got more ability. I think he's got kind of that silky smooth, like cut crossing lines in the defense that you love. So while I don't think he's as efficient a passer as I originally thought after getting the all 22, I think he's still pretty darn good. And I and dude just can make plays like in a way that you can't in the same way Caleb Williams does. Like when the moment's on, it's like, I got you. I'm the guy. Right. And I think there's value to that. Yeah. I think there's that. And there is, I keep saying consistency. It's not actually, I think the best word now that you talk about it a little bit more, like there's a decisiveness to his game that I really I think so like. too. Yeah. And like, that's something that I think I struggle with, with Williams. And it's something I struggle with, with May is like Jaden gets the ball out when it's supposed to be out. And if he doesn't, then like he doesn't panic. And yeah. maybe that this is, this is where, you know, why scouts get paid lots of money and why I host a podcast is I don't know enough about LSU's offensive line compared to the defensive lines they're going up against compared to whatever else. I'm obviously not watching all 22. So it's kind of hard to see what the coverage is. Like maybe he's holding the ball and he's sitting there back there, you know, popping up and down smiling and there's three open receivers. And it's like, dude, throw the football. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, like there's not a lot of panic to his game. He generally gets the ball out on time. And then if he doesn't, he's like, okay, where can I go to run? And he's very, very good at the running thing. And so I, I think that that to me translates very well to the NFL level. I, and we also talked before on, on this show that one huge feature of Cliff's offense in Arizona was a lot of balls to the outside. He's yeah. got a ton of experience doing that because he had great receivers. And I remember having this conversation on the air with Linnell a couple of weeks ago. And he's like, well, Jaden's throwing to, you know, two first round picks. And it's like, yeah, but when they're wide open and he hits them in stride, what are we supposed to do? Penalize them? And you yeah. talk about that deep ball ability and like he hits those dudes in stride. Like he is so, so good with that. And so um, those are the things that I like about Jaden. Um, the hits definitely concern me. It's like, bro, you cannot look like you have an Acme anvil that just fell out of the sky on you on a regular basis. What are we doing? Um, so there's that. And, and I think that obviously, as you said, you dive a little deeper into the tape, maybe some of the stuff that looks good on TV and, and worked out that you get away with in college, it's not going to work quite as well in the NFL. Yeah, and it's, and it's close. It's borderline. And I think when you compare that aspect of their games, Drake May and um, Jane Daniels, I think Drake May has an advantage, and he should, right? You know, he's got two really good years of football. But I think, again, the ability to make plays, to make – there's a, a dig. And the ability to learn in game was another thing I liked. So I was watching some of the Alabama game last night, and the first play, the first drop back they have, they've got like a, a wheel and a dig, Right. And the, the dig window is a little cloudy, but it's open, and he probably should throw it. But he tucks it down and scrambles for eight yards. Later in the game, and I feel like kind of after you find your rhythm, you start playing a little bit better. They're on a two-minute drive. He has a big scramble. The very next play, that, they run the same concept, wheel, dig. He's a little late to the dig, but it's a tight window. Good ball placement, gets the ball completed, and they get the ball down to the one they score the next play. So I like that, that he can go to the sideline, get some feedback, come back. They can run the same play, and they can execute especially against the defenses, again, like as complicated as I was, like it was 
I watch it. I watch NFL football every week. I watch the all 22 every week. And I have not seen a defensive structure that complicated in the back end in a long time. Like it was a lot of stuff going on. So I, I give him some grace there. And so again, like the, the ability to throw the deep ball, I think he's got a nice quick release. It's nice and tight. I think his footwork's pretty good. And then the electricity that he brings as a playmaker, quite honestly, man, like you just can't coach it. And it, it breaks the back of defenses. And Alabama, say what you want about them. You know, they're probably in a little bit of a down year this year. But that's the most NFL-looking defense they're probably going to see in college football. And he was walking around on those guys, you know, just slashing, making explosive plays. And I just think there's there's something to that. You know, and is he perfect? Does he have a little bit more growing to do as a passer? Yeah, but I do think he's farther along than a guy like Robert. And he did smell, like when you watch the film, I think he throws a better ball than college Lamar. You know what I mean? And so I do think there's a lot of things to like here from his game that make you say, wow, like he could be very productive at the next level. It's just it maybe high, maybe a good way to put it is like higher ceiling, but probably a little bit lower floor than Drake May. And I think Drake May has a very high ceiling, but I just think that running ability, that ability to totally terrorize defenses as a passer and a runner is going to be very unique. And he's the only guy in the class this year that really has that ability. So that's another reason why you feel pretty good about it. Yeah, see that I I don't know I I gotta watch more May, but I do think that often the running ability puts a floor under guys. Where like I don't know about the lower floor thing because like the worst case scenario is he goes and runs around a lot. Now maybe that gets him killed in the NFL and that there goes your quarterback yeah. before you ever get started. Maybe that floor is lower than whatever May is. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that I I think like you know when Lamar came out you're like. I don't know, that dude's probably going to run around and like, we'll see if he develops as a passer, but they can probably win some games with him running around. If he winds up being a career backup running around, uh, cool. But, you know, obviously it's gone the other way and he's a two-time MVP. So um, it is, it's a hard, hard thing. I, I do, I, I will say, you know, if you think he's Lamar as a runner, go back and watch Lamar. Like go watch. No, I was I'm not as, that. as I'm not. I know you're not as a Syracuse alum who was watched Lamar have his official coming out party against us on a Friday night in the Carrier Dome back in 20 whatever that was. I was like I've never seen a dude like this uh, in my life, and neither has anyone else. And turns out that's exactly who is in the NFL mm -hmm. as a runner. Um, it's what well, maybe it, I guess Mike Vick would like to have a word, but literally like that's it. That's the list. Um, but if he's 85 percent of that as a runner, like. That's a 600, 700 yard rusher with a bunch of touchdowns and probably a 70 yard, you know, TD run at some point in the year. And that is extremely valuable. So I, all these guys, I think it's going to come down to coaching. It's going to come down to the system that they're in and, um, and the combine process. And, and I think what we hear about them in the interview process is going to be pretty interesting. So big week for all three ahead in Indianapolis. the Take Command Podcast. That's Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. All right, Logan, there's a next group of three in terms of the quarterbacks that I think everyone's got in a different order. Uh, Michael Penix seems to be the guy that's that's in sixth, if you will, uh, most of the, most places. And then mm -hmm. it's pick your flavor of Bo Nix or J.J. McCarthy. I think Nix is probably the would come in fourth in a, in a universal rankings, then McCarthy, then Penix. There's some guys that love McCarthy. There's some guys that are like, I don't want to touch McCarthy with a 10 foot pole, super wide variance there, which makes sense because there's only so much tape on him, which we'll get to in a second. How would you rank those three though? And then we can get into them each individually uh, in a more efficient manner than we did the previous three. Uh, yeah. If I was going to rank them, that's a really good question. I think, you know, based on what I've been hearing from like NFL people, it seems like J.J. McCarthy is like definitively the fourth guy, you know, for the It does league. seem like he's climbing back up after Nick's yeah. had a couple of good weeks. Yeah. And like, I think that's, it makes sense. Like when you watch him, I think when you watch him, like, obviously there's not a lot to draw from there. There's not a lot of kind of like, oh, like he throws, I think there was, what was it? It was like over three games he threw for like 250 and, you know, like Bo Nix and Michael Penix do that like in a quarter, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like it's just like such a different evaluation. So you're like hunting and pecking and clawing and watching all this film for him. But I think the thing that you come out of it is like he has he has the arm talent. He has the ability. He's played in a very complicated pro style offense already in at Michigan. And um, I don't think he layers throws particularly well. I think he's a better athlete than people think. But um, he he is very physically talented. And I think that's the thing that I keep forgetting about with the evaluation is there is a I do this thing that's a binary yes, no. 
right? And so what it is, is just like physically, can they play the position at the NFL level? And so there's times where you're watching guys you're like, I don't know, you know what I mean? I don't know if he's fast enough or big enough or whatever. And I think McCarthy emphatically checks that box from like a tool standpoint. And so I think NFL coaches know that like they get him in the building, it's going to be okay. Now, if you're talking about film, like Bo Nix's film is way better. I think even Penix Jr.'s film is way better. But I think there's that, that uh, he shows you enough of the physical traits to say, hey, I can, I can be the fourth guy. Now, do I love that? Probably not. But I'm going to kind of lean to the NFL. I'm going to defer to the NFL in this situation because I'd probably have Bo Nix ahead of him. Might even have Michael Penix ahead of him, honestly, based on really? my evaluation. But – but I, I get what the NFL is talking about with him. And I think that's where I'm going to say, just like, I understand it. Do I agree with it from a talent evaluation? Probably not, but I'm going to put him at four just for the conversation. So you're on, but I want your rankings like scout Logan here. <laughs> scout Logan's going Nick's McCarthy Penix or Nick's Nick's uh, Penix McCarthy. It's tough. It's really like these guys, these guys, this group is really hard, a little bit harder than the first group. Cause I feel like that, you know, it's Caleb and then there's a camp for, uh, for Drake may. And I understand that camp and there's a camp for Jaden Daniels. And I kind of think if I were going to rank those guys, Caleb, Drake may Daniels is probably how I'd go. And it's close, but I think that the passing ability of Drake may kind of makes that a little bit easier. This group is hard, man. It is hard. It's like what flavor of ice cream, do you want yeah like if you want a dude with a cannon arm that can like kind of touch everywhere in the field it's Penix. but Penix can't make every single throw because everything's coming out like a freaking laser beam he can't run around as much as you want he's a true pocket passer with you a, know what that describes like he's like byron leftwich uh, yeah but he's released uh, yeah like that but uh, but but arm, a much faster release yeah yeah leftwich. much faster release yeah but like Leftwich just threw darts everywhere. He stood yeah. back there. He wasn't mobile and he just threw darts and he didn't layer throws. And he just like that ball was coming through your chest plate, whether it was a five yard comeback or like a 25 yard dig, like it was yeah. going to hit you between the numbers and knock your breath out. And so there's definitely that element to his game. So you don't see a lot of like, Oh, look at this nice touch throw. Like you get from Drake may or, or even Jaden Daniels. You don't get that from him. It's like, Howitzer, Howitzer, deep ball. Here's Roma Dunze mossing somebody. Here's Pope jumping over a guy and making a contested catch. And he's great at those. And he's good at giving those guys opportunities. But that, if that's your flavor, take that flavor. Bo Nix, I think, does a much better job with, like, the three levels of the field. You got quick game. You got intermediate. You got deep stuff. Did they ask him to do a lot of the deep stuff? No. It was a lot of, like, quick screens. That Oregon offense is very kind of gimmicky in that way. Quick screens, slants. You know, they got the middle of the field stuff and he sees it and he's very he's very physically gifted from an arm and movement standpoint. He's very fast, fat, much faster than I thought, much better athlete than I thought. So that's why I'd probably put him ahead of Bone of, uh, of Michael Penix Jr., excuse me. Um, but I can see why that's my personal ranking, but I can see why someone would say, shoot, I like the guy with the howitzer over this guy who's in kind of this gimmicky college offense. Now, he does make all the throws. He's got the ability. I think the thing we forgot to talk about with the other guys, too, is that. Bo Nix was bad at Auburn, like, like just not yeah. good. And then Penix has this crazy injury, injury history. Same thing with Jane Daniels. Like Jane Daniels has 14 amazing games. And then when you look at Drake may, he's got 28 amazing, like really good games. You know what I'm saying? So like the body right. work Daniels at ASU, game. not super special, right? Probably a fourth round pick, maybe a fifth round pick. And now we're talking about maybe, maybe top five pick in the NFL. So, but that's what I think about Bo Nix. I like Bo Nix's film a little bit better, but then he goes down to the senior bowl, struggles a little bit. You don't see it quite be as dynamic as you were hoping for. So I'm a little gun shy after that, but I'd probably go him, Penix, and then I would probably go McCarthy. And again, that's my ranking because there's just not a lot of stuff to make decisions on. Like when you, it's the same thing. If you watch McCarthy's highlight tape, you're like, oh, this is for sure an NFL quarterback. Then you watch a game, a couple, you have to watch a couple games with him. You watch like three or four games with him, and you're like, there's an inconsistency to his play that is a little alarming. But the, in terms of tools, he's probably got the best tools, like consistent tools of the bunch. And I think that's why people in the NFL are higher on him. Yeah, I think the age thing also becomes really interesting because Penix yes. and Knicks are older. McCarthy's 21 which yeah. also gives you hope for the body type because yes. he's six three. Like, I mean, th his weigh in is actually huge for him. Yeah. In Indy. If he weighs in at two twenty or two fifteen, even then you're like, Oh, he's going to be QB four. Yeah. Like 
done. And like not done, but like but he's gonna run well. He's gonna jump well. He's, he's gonna, gonna run he's well. He's gonna athlete. jump well. All that stuff. So does he? He's most recently listed. A Google search tells you that he's six yeah. three two zero three. Yeah, that is not a, small. Not a, not a big guy, right? Yeah. yeah. At six three, you need to be weighing more than two hundred three to play NFL <laughs> quarterback. Like that's that's a, that's a yikes. And he looks thin. Like when you yeah. watch him out there, you're like, that's not a big dude. Um, so if he comes in at two fifteen, and you're like, well, he's twenty one years old. By the time he's twenty three, by the time he's the age of these other guys, he'll be two twenty five, and it'll be fine. Like, cool, we're done. Like we're now now. What is he as a talent? And with that that worry gone, see ya. And so I think it's a big week for McCarthy. He's going to interview really well. You know that, you know, obviously he can take really high-level coaching because Harbaugh was his guy at, at Michigan. Um, I think there's a lot to like there. But I, um, think, I, think, I think talking about that, you know, the age and maturity and the consistency and all those things, I think we talked about it some with May in that first group. I think McCarthy obviously is the outlier here where the other two guys are 23. I think they both are currently. And McCarthy is, is only 21. Yeah, and I think the other thing just to point out is the uh, is the TCU game last year. They had to throw the ball a lot because the game flow got a little crazy. And I think he threw a pick, but you see that ability just to kind of touch all spots of the field. It feels very NFL starter ish in terms of his command and his composure. So, and they're playing TCU, so take that for what it's worth. But I, th I think that like when I talk to NFL people, they say, "Oh, watch that TCU game." And I get it. When you watch a TCU game, you get it. But it's like that's one game out of the last couple of years. But, again, very talented guy. But, again, for me, it's probably Bo Nix, Penix, and then him. But I I totally understand the NFL's perspective. If you guys are at home, Google the TCU game. Watch it. Let me know what you think in the comments. But that's a big element for him. And then I think the the met, like the like the physical tools are also really sharp. And then to get the endorsement from Harbaugh, too, I think it's also kind of a big deal. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, going to be an interesting week for all three of those guys, for sure. And then obviously the pro days and all that kind of stuff, you know, I, and, and then I think we'll start to get a better sense through some of the mock drafts and stuff, just how high that QB four is going. Like, are we talking about three quarterbacks in the top three? And one of them goes, I mean, Matt Miller's first, I think Matt's changed off of this now, but like his first one, he had McCarthy going like seven. Like, well, right now, eight, eight is the spot everyone's saying, right? Yeah, Atlanta. Atlanta. So could you see could you see that? Or are we talking about, you know, 13 in Las Vegas? Are we talking 16? Like, because if all of a sudden McCarthy goes eight, let's say, like, are all six of these dudes going in the first round? Like, it, it becomes very possible very quickly. And that, yeah. obviously, I th would say is great for the commanders because it bumps other, other players down. Yeah. But, I mean, it's – who knows? Who knows? Yeah, and I also think that, that that trade back scenario is really interesting too, like with Atlanta specifically for, for Washington. And people say, oh, well, we need a quarterback, but I just saw a recent kind of projected trade value for um, for the commanders, uh, not for the for for Atlanta to go to one. And it was three first three first round picks, three second round picks over the next couple of years of drafts. And that that is an organizational, you know, windfall in terms of your ability to kind of build through the draft. So <clears throat> Maybe Washington trades, they, they pick that guy. Maybe they, it's McCarthy or Bo Nix or whatever it looks like. Right. So I think it's important we address those guys. I think it's too high for both those guys. And quite honestly, like I could even see like Jane Daniels slipping to eight in some weird universe, like after the combine comes out, interviews are done, like he slips to eight. Maybe that works out. But I think like it's important to note that we're talking a lot about quarterbacks here, but I do think because of the value of Drake May, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, there is a lot of potential draft capital that could be returned here. And then we're talking about one of these three guys is maybe the guy they're, they're going with for the season. So, and I think that just comes down to like, how much more do you like those top guys than these guys? Cause if it's not that much, then you should trade down. Like, and we'll or, talk about or, those situations. To me, to me, or it's even the value. If, if the value is crazy, if someone's giving you four, like three firsts and three seconds to move up that many spots. Yeah, like, well, unless, unless you think that you're like, you secretly think that, you know, one of these dudes is Mahomes because there's yeah. no you could trade hey Kansas City I'll give you my next how many are we allowed to trade I'll give you that for Mahomes they're going no like yeah. absolutely not right. um so it just it just depends but like yeah no I I tend to agree with you and it, again it's like okay if I my QB3 and QB4 aren't that different cool let's trade yeah. down um yeah. so so we'll see Wrapping up here on Take Man, I'm Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. And now, Logan, um, I want to call this the break glass in case of emergency uh, 
group, but I do, you know, let, let's say it's, you know, the set the fan base on fire uh, group kind of, kind of let's, let's go crazy here. What happens if with that number two pick, the commanders are like, either they trade down and don't wind up taking quarterback in the first round, or they're like, yeah, psych, any quarterback we ever take in the history of the next 10 years of our franchise is going to be helped by Marvin Harrison Jr. So we're taking Marvin Harrison right. Jr. Um, which means that probably at pick 36 or or 40, uh, you're looking at someone else. And let's say that all those quarterbacks go, and now you're looking at the next wave of guys. And whether it's, you know, 36, 40, or one of the other uh, two top 100, whatever it is, picks that they have in that third round, are there any guys that you like there that you think do have futures as NFL starters? Yeah, there are a couple guys. I mean, obviously at 36 or 40, I'm praying to God that Michael Penix or, you know, Bo Nix or one of those guys has a little bit of a tumble and you're picking and you just catch them right. And I think that would be perfect. I think they're, they're all pretty good. They all have their warts, but I, I see you get, you get, you get Drew Brees, you get the yeah. second rounder that works out. Yeah. They're all, they all got starting caliber traits. They all got starting caliber, like ability with air quotes. So I think you would feel like not great. I don't think you're getting a generational guy, but a guy that could, you know, be a top 15 quarterback at some point in his career. He also could be out of the league, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, so the next kind of tier guy to me is Spencer Rattler. And I know people hate that, but he has the physical tools to get that done. Like he can throw the football. He's got some mobility. He's He's got the traits that say he can, he can project to a starter at the NFL level at some point in his career. And I know people are freaking out about that because they saw that episode of him on Last Chance You or whatever the hell that was. But I talked to the I talked to the OC down in at, uh, at South Carolina, and basically they said like he's an awesome guy. He's been a great leader for us and really dynamic. And I think there's something to that. People change, they grow up. So he does have the physical tools to get it done. Now, does he always see the field perfectly? No. Is he always making the best decisions? No, but at the senior bowl, he was the best quarterback down there. So, like, he obviously picked up the offense really quick. He built chemistry with the guys uh, on a short week. So, I think he's the kind of the the next guy if you're looking for somebody. And probably not in the second round, but I think for sure in the third round, if you need a quarterback and you want to take a flyer on somebody, I think that's a guy that falls right in your wheelhouse. I don't know how you feel right. about that, Greg. Do you like yeah, that one? Yeah, I mean, no? I I would say like out in Vegas. I feel like his name. I mean, he was out there. Um, yeah. his name popped up a couple times and people were like, eh, not, not real sure why, like what the, the deal is there. So, so that's more from the NFL side of stuff for the people that I talk to. So like, and I think, I think again, it goes back to the AJ McCarthy thing. And, and what I mean by that is like, you're just looking for someone who passes that binary box. Is your arm strong enough? Is your release fast enough? Are your mechanics good enough to, to play football at the NFL level? And he is a guy that you would say yes for. So I understand why he is now in this conversation as the seventh quarterback, right? Seventh quarterback, maybe eighth quarterback. The other guy is Michael Pratt from Tulane, who feels a lot like Taylor Heineke, like not a super strong arm, but throws with great anticipation, has a playmaking moxie to him. But again, he's, he's further down my list because I think Spencer, Spencer Rattler's got better tools. So I'm going to take him ahead and hopefully he develops. If he doesn't, it's a third round pick that I don't get back and I'm not really that bummed about it. So. Yeah, I think another couple of guys. I know Joe Milton's name comes up a lot from Tennessee, Dude. who's got like the craziest Cannon. arm in the draft, but Cannon. doesn't really have a uh, whole lot of discretion on how to use it. <laughs> yeah, you know, but he's he's a great thrower. He, Dude, like, I mean, you know, so he's they, at the senior bowl. Yeah, good. Yeah. Oh no, good. you tell your story first, and then I have, I will do a Joe Milton prediction game, and that's how we'll wrap the show. So he was he was at the senior bowl, and I'll, you get to walk down on the field afterwards, and he is. Big as all get out, you know, he's 6'5", almost 6'6", six, six. he's 245, built like an Adonis, he can run, I think he's going to run probably like a 5'4", 6'0", low 4'7", like he is a physical freak, like with the ball like rips off of his hand like he's throwing a gosh dang Nerf ball, but like is it always going to the right person? No. Like is it always going in the right space? <laughs> no. Is it have any touch on it? No. But in terms of like, if you drew up a quarterback and like create a player in Madden, like that's what he looks like. And I really think if you wanted to make more money, you should move to tight end. Like that, after seeing him in person, like dude should probably play tight end. So they do a quarterback drill at the combine where they have the quarterbacks 
throw the ball as hard as they can into a gigantic pad oh. and put a, a clock on it. What miles per hour will Joe Milton throw a football? 60 is kind of the threshold of like, you got it if you can, th- if you can buzz it above 60. I, I, dude, he might throw it 75. I, you know, so they did RPMs at the Senior Bowl and the ball there, yeah. and they put it up on the screen after each day. And so I forget what day it was, probably the third day. You looked up at the quarterback chart, right? And you're like, what's going on up there? And it's Joe Milton, farthest ball. Joe Milton, highest RPM. Joe Milton, highest mile per hour per throw. And you're like, dude is absolutely slinging it. So I think he's probably going to throw like 75 miles an hour. Like he's going to throw a baseball in that son of a gun. Like he can absolutely. <laughs> I, now I got to know what the record thing. is. What's, <laughs> like, let's see if I can look this up. What's the hardest QB throw ever at NFL combine miles per hour? Last year's top guys. Let's see. It looks like it looks like sixty two is like the record. Dude, he's you got Josh himself. Allen. DTR last year hit sixty two. What was Josh Allen? Sixty two. I think I think he hit sixty two. Dude, no, our guy's breaking it this year. No doubt in my mind. No doubt. Sixty five, seventy, something like that. He is ripping that son of a gun. Yeah, I've seen something sixty six maybe, but yeah, Logan Thomas back in the day threw sixty, but. uh <laughs> Cause it's like, it's like a short throw. Yeah. It's um, pretty tight, it's, but I, but, yeah, you know, they're going to, they're going to throw on air and they do that drill where they throw the ball as far as they can. I fully, ex- like he threw the ball 80 yards at Peyton Manning's passing camp, 85 yards in the air. Like, think about yeah. that. Like dude is a, I mean, can he play football? No, but yeah, he can rip it. Like, so I want to see, you know, that. you know, it's going to suck. You know, you know, whose days not fun is the receiver. Who's got to be his receiver in that drill. Hey yeah. dude, Start running. <laughs> yeah. Like, actually, Start running. Gonna, yeah. Just like run, like run to Prime 47. Run <laughs> yeah, to St. Uh, yeah, I want to see you, it. If you know, you know. Uh, maybe <laughs> perhaps run run to velocity. That's the one yeah, that's, uh, that's most apropos, uh, considering the topic here. Uh, all right. That's our show. Uh, just a couple of names to watch there at the end. But uh, hopefully, you now know the quarterbacks a little bit better, a um, little bit more depth. And I think you also, I, I think certainly what I get out of this episode, Logan, too, is, you know, considering we've been talking about these guys for already, you know, what, a month and a half, almost two months, yeah. to see how you're shifting on Daniels in May and like some of the things that start to, emerge as you watch more tape and as you understand more about the offenses they played in and all these kinds of things. And I, I think on top of obviously if, if you're just tapping into the draft now and this is your quarterbacks one oh one, like hope you now have a really good base on you go to the water cooler and you can talk to your buddies about about, you know, these guys. But also I think you gave great insight into the process and, and that's something that will continue to evolve and uh you know why mock draft one point is different than two point oh, three point oh and uh, why we why we do so many of these leading up to the actual day in late April. All right, for Logan Paulson, uh, who you can follow on Instagram at Lung, Logan underscore Paulson 82, uh, and also watch uh, on YouTube with all the Commander's content, Command Center being the main show there. Uh, I'm Craig Hoffman, which you can listen to me on the radio. Uh, typically, I'm off this week, but back at it next week, including shows from Indianapolis, four to seven on the team 980. Uh, that's it. We're done talking now. See it for Mindy. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't you why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do 1067 the fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do do what Logan said. Do it's it. Very, very smart. <laughs> <laughs>